שלום, ערב טוב, שמי ישי יפה, אני נתן בספטר, ונעבור לאנגלית מעכשיו ואילך. אני מאוד שמח לברך אתכם לסגן אנואל אסטר ואיצר אסטר פנושיב, ואנחנו מאוד שמחים להיות איתנו ‫לפני הלונגרס של חוות ביזנס גרום. ‫לפני שנתחיל, ‫אנחנו נתחיל לראות לכם ‫שורט וידאו ‫עם גרייטים של גייל אסטר, ‫הפרסידנט של אסטר פונדיישן, ‫הספונסור של הזה, ‫והספונסור של אסטר סנטר ‫לאסטר פונדיישן ‫בבית הספר של ביזנס אדמיניסטרציה. ‫בוקר טוב לכולם. ‫אני מאוד 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 Ladies and gentlemen, students and professors, I'm Gail Asper, president of the Asper Foundation, and I'm delighted to be bringing you this warm Winnipeg welcome. Um, of course, it's probably a lot warmer where you are, um, but I'm, and I just actually wish I could be there with you today to share this wonderful lecture. First of all, we are very, very pleased that the Asper Center is bringing um, these wonderful lectures to, to the school. Uh, these are lectures who are renowned in the fields of entrepreneurship, finance, venture capital, and startup strategies. And today, of course, you're going to be enjoying the words of Dr. Paul Gompers, and I think it's going to be a wonderful occasion. My dad, Israel Asper, who founded the center, he created the center to give students the opportunity to explore entrepreneurship as a viable option for their careers, because he believed that entrepreneurs are the wealth creators. My dad was a great entrepreneur himself, and he loved Israel, and he also recognized that for a country like Israel to succeed, it was going to have to rely on its entrepreneurial talents. So I am sure that you're going to have a most interesting and enlightening lecture today. I would like to say a huge thank you to Niron Hishai, Professor Niron Hishai, who heads up the Asper Center, and of course, the Asper Center, the, the business school dean, Hishai Yafa. Thank you for all your efforts to make this wonderful lecture series happen, and have a great day. OK, and Professor Niron Hishai, The very director of the Asper Center will introduce all the people. Okay, good evening. <laughs> so let's start. Before we go, Dr. Espoir Gompers is a Eugene Homer Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He received his BA, Summa Cum Laude, in Biology at Harvard College, and then his MSc in Economics at Oxford University, and PhD in Business Economics at Harvard University. After two years with the, as an assistant professor at the University of Chicago, he came back and was at Harvard Business School. Uh, importantly, the teaching and research focus of uh, Professor Bompers is on entrepreneurial finance and management. Specifically, he studies the structure, performance, and governance of private equity firms, as we clear today, sources of financing and performance of uh, private and pub newly public uh, entrepreneur firm, has written uh, three books and published extensively in top academic journals such as the uh, <coughs> Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Finance, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Review of Financial Studies, and so on and so forth. And uh, he has over 23,000 Google citations. So that's an enormous number for those of you who cannot really appreciate it. Now, uh, usually I would stop here, you know, after so much uh, credential for an academic, but in the case of Professor Gompers, uh, it's a bit more complicated because he is also a business person. So uh, he's the co-founder and director of uh, Spark Capital Partners, a VC fund of funds that uh, invests in uh, technology centers, uh, so not technology centered VC funds. So he has also a strong leg in the business. And if we are talking about legs, he is also a very talented long distance runner. This is something that I appreciate a lot. <laughs> uh, he had a few national records. He was on the US Olympic team to uh, Seoul 1988 in marathon. His record in marathon is 2.11. 2 hours 11 minutes. It's 4 minutes better than the Israeli current record. <laughs> We are honored today to have a great academic, a great businessman, and a great athlete. So, <laughs> <laughs>
thank you, thank you, Neuron, and, and uh, I, <laughs> I hope I can live up to the uh, introduction. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an honor here, and, and I hope you'll excuse me because uh, for any of you who've actually uh, been to the Harvard Business School, we, 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 we don't stand behind uh, a lectern. We sort of walk around, we talk, and I'd get very nervous uh, if I stood up there. So I'm going to just walk around and talk, but it, it, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, I certainly have a, a, a strong uh, a fondness for Israel. Uh, I have a strong connection here, both in terms of having, having been more than 30 times here to Israel. Um, my daughter spent this last summer doing research uh, for her senior thesis at Harvard in, uh, in Israel. As well as, um, as Neron said, our investment fund has actually made uh, a number of investments within Israel. And it's been, it's been a privilege to be a part of, of the high tech sector in Israel as an, as an investor in a number of uh, Israeli venture funds. Um, I've written a lot on, on venture capital, but I'm actually not going to talk today about venture capital because the, the topic today is, is, is one which is sort of a new area of research which, which I've been undertaking. Um, and, and the genesis of what I'm going to talk about is actually a paper, but, but I'm not going to go through too much of the paper uh, because I think this audience is more interested in the punchline of the paper. So I started this, uh, the thinking about this paper when I started a new course at, at, at Harvard Business School three years ago. I started a course entitled Private Equity Finance. And um, the reason I started this course was that we have a tremendous, you'll see, we have a tremendous um, uh, presence in the private equity industry as, as a school in terms of, of, of managers of top private equity firms. And our students were really um, eager for a course which taught them uh, what to do in private equity. But the idea for this paper actually came over the dinner conversation with, with my wife. Uh, as many research ideas, I hope, come to you uh, over a dinner conversation with your spouse. And my wife is, um, is a doctor. She's a physician. And, and uh, my, my mother-in-law uh, le never let me forget that she was the real doctor in the family. Um, but but we ha we're having this discussion. And, and, and she, she deals with diabetic patients. And she, she, she was complaining at the dinner table that her patients never did what she said they should do. They never followed her advice. And I actually said, I said, well, you know, I don't have this problem. You know, when, when, I, when I grade my students, my students do what I teach them. They do exactly what I tell them to do. But then she actually asked the question. She said, but aha, do they, when they leave school, do they do what you taught them? And I s looked at her and I sort of said, I don't know. Uh, and so with Steve Kaplan, who's a very close friend at Chicago, who also works on private equity, and one of my PhD students, uh, Vladimir Mikarlimov, we decided to find out. Do, do private equity managers do what we teach them? Um, and how does what they do relate to theories and research that we in, in the finance profession uh, profess to be the truth? And so that was really the genesis behind, uh, behind this paper. Please move. <laughs> Israeli technology? No. Uh, is it open? Is it open? Thank you, Mira. I'm pressing the button. I'm bright. What am I doing? It's okay. I'll, I'll, you know, I may end up here and may, maybe. Okay, we'll, we'll end up here for. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, except I did that. Okay. Is it stuck? The flash No, I'll just hit page down. Page down works. Um, shh, okay. Uh, now this is, the, listen, uh, I, 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 you know, we often do these things to test people, and so can I deal with adversity? So anyway, I'm dealing with adversity. Oh, thank you, Shai. Look at this. Um, Hopefully this will work. <laughs> ah, no, so which, which one do I use? This one. Ah, perfect, awesome. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Shai. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, the, why, why do we care what private equity investors do? Um, so we have, we have motivation from, from research that looks at private equity performance. And people have looked at this over the last decade. People have looked at private equity performance. And in general, what they've found is that private equity investors tend to do very well. On average, the funds um, 
So, exa uh, so for example, um, uh, they show that, that the funds outperform net of fees relative uh, to the S&P 500, uh, relative to um, uh, underlying beta portfolios where you try to adjust for the risk. And so as an aggregate asset class, private, act private equity has actually been uh, a very good performing asset class. So we would hope that these are investors who are smart, who have skills, who actually do the right thing in their, in their investing. This is just some, some, so, some tables from papers, the you know, ways of sort of looking at a performance. And as you can sort of see, um, uh, what, the, what, this, what this is, is, is it, it groups funds by the year in which the fund was started. And just think about one as being, are you above the benchmark return? And so a number above one means that these funds are earning positive risk adjusted returns on average. And you can see that, you know, on average, uh, across almost all the vintage years of private equity funds, except for those that were raised perhaps during the peak of the financial crisis, um, seem to outperform relative to, to sort of appropriate risk, uh, rich, risk benchmarks. Uh, this is true on both sort of a, 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 um, a equally weighted as well as on, a, on, a, on an uh, equity weighted basis. So, so these are good performing funds. Uh, it's also the case that the underlying portfolio companies themselves outperform. So research has looked at whether or not if you compare a company that receives money from a private equity investor outperforms a similar company uh, that, that doesn't have private equity backing. And research here is pretty, again, pretty um, convincing that private equity firms help the companies that they're investing in perform better, uh, better than, than, than their peers. Uh, it's, it's also the case that if you look at private equity managers, they have very strong incentives that, that in general, private equity investors get 20% of the profits of the funds that they, that they invest. And so they have a very strong per performance incentive to, to, to actually do well. They generally tend to be extremely highly paid. Um, they're some of the most highly uh, compensated positions after business school and going forward. And so it's not you know, it, it's, it's not surprising that we would expect these people to be doing the, the sort of right thing. So it suggests perhaps that, you know, private equity uh, firms attract talented MBAs. Um, I, I, would, I would sort of uh, offer to you that, that when I speak with my students um, uh, or across the entire MBA program, the private equity jobs are perhaps the most sought after jobs uh, at the Harvard Business School, that uh, students view this as, as, as an exciting career, an opportunity to do, to do quite well. Uh, we would expect them, as I said, to take actions that, that, that help uh, generate these positive returns. And so we would hope that they're doing what we're teaching them they should be doing. And so are they doing the kinds of analyses and choices that we teach in, in, in our courses? Um, and again, we're gonna, I'm going to go through the paper and really focus on, on sort of three areas of, of decision making that private equity firms engage in and see whether or not what they say they do is actually what we would teach in financial engineering. So things like investment decision making. Do they make investment decisions in ways which are consistent with what we teach in, in our basic finance courses or with what we teach in, in advanced finance courses? Um, do they set capital structure in ways that, that we teach capital structure should be set? Uh, governance engineering, do they, do they um, impose governance standards and do they become involved in, in the governance of firms in such a way that, that it seems consistent with what we would expect uh, active governance to be? And then finally, operational engineering, do they become actively involved in, in the companies in which they invest? Um, so, so across the survey, you know, we, we, you know, financial engineering will be things like valuation, capital budgeting, capital structure and incentives. Governance engineering are things like board and monitoring, uh, board service and monitoring of the management. Uh, value creation will be things like deal sourcing, operational engineering, and then the basic uh, private equity firm organization. And so, so what we did is to, dev to devise a survey that surveyed the, the largest private equity firms, and I'll talk about who answered this, but in general, do these private equity firms, do these large private equity firms do, do what we think they should be doing? Um, so, so as I mentioned, a significant amount of research, I mean, if, you know, most of, of, of corporate finance is, is geared around just answering these, these three basic questions about you know, how, uh, how should firms be valued? Um, I can tell you on the first day of finance, we teach, we teach our students about discounted cash flow. How many people on the first day of finance learn discounted cash flow in here? 
Yeah, that's right, right? Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it's the basic premise of finance. It goes back 50 years that the value of any asset is equal to its, the, 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 the discounted present value of expected future cash flows. It's, it's so fundamental as to be almost, you know, uh, you can't argue with it, but the real question is what happens here in these, in these firms? Um, it, it's important for capital allocation and the like. Um, and so, so we, 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 we go through and we, we ask questions about um, how does this, how does, how, how does uh, what we teach uh, affect what they do? And then we try to relate, relate these, the answer to these questions in, in meaningful ways based on the type of firm it is, a large firm, a global firm. We actually gather data on the backgrounds of the firm founders. And do we see differences across what the firms do based on whether or not the founders of the private equity firm had finance backgrounds in terms of investment banking, whether they come from operating and consulting backgrounds, uh, or some other, some other industry. And so does, does the strategy employed by the private equity firms uh, somehow uh, 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 is it somehow related to the, the, the founder's backgrounds? So for many of you who are, I, I, all the academics in the room, at least the finance academics will know, but there's a couple of famous surveys done in corporate finance that, that, date, back, uh, that date back now uh, a little over a decade. But Graham and Harvey surveyed um, uh, CFOs in the US and asked them some similar types of questions. Um, uh, specifically related to capital structure uh, and investment decision making. And, and, and the paper was, was geared around the same sets of issues, which is do, do the people who are responsible for finance functions within companies do the type of things that we as financial academics um, teach and, and, th and say they should be doing? And so, um, so we're going to try to, to, to draw some similar implications for uh, for the private equity industry. So what we did is we, we contacted um, uh, we, 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 the sample that we looked at, uh, the sample that we collected where uh, we, we identified 136 large uh, private equity firms and um, we, we, we did this through our networks. Uh, Steve and I called a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of people and said we're doing a survey, would you fill it out? Uh, and this was actually quite useful because at the end of the day, the, of the 136, 106 said, yes, yeah, send me the survey. Of that 106, we got at least uh, partially completed uh, surveys from 79 and complete surveys from uh, 64. And for those of you who actually read the survey literature, this is the first time I've ever done a survey, um, these are really high response rates. Um, typical response rates are substantially below this. And so um, we felt pretty good that, that this would be uh, represented. So example, like Graham and Harvey finds a, a, a roughly 9% uh, uh, response rate. Uh, Durin and, and Pelipu uh, have a 14% uh, response rate. So ours is, is, is a multiple uh, of their response rates. And so we feel pretty good about being representative of, of the industry. Um, so as, uh, as of the end of 2012, when we look at these 79 uh, private equity firms who, uh, who completed at least part of the survey, they represent $754 billion of assets under management. Uh, the, the 64 who completed the, the, the survey in its entirety represent $618 billion of assets. Um, uh, and, and you should realize that the assets of the, of the companies they control is substantially larger. So the typical private equity firm is levered at, let's say, two or three to one. So in order to figure out how much stuff they own, you probably want to num uh, multiply this number by two or three to get the, the size of, the, of, the, the, size of the, 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 the portfolio that they own in terms of, of total enterprise value. When we, when we looked at some other lists, um, uh, P, uh, private Equity International lists the, the top global private equity firms by asset under management. We have 11 of the top 25 in our survey uh, and 46% of the capital raised by those 25 firms in the last five years is represented within our, within our sample. So this just shows you some, some of the summary statistics here. You know, on average, these are pretty large. The average firm has uh, about nine and a half billion assets under management. You can sort of see they do range in size. 
um, uh, uh, sort of a fair bit. Many of them are non-US, so, so we have some which are in entirely in the US, but we also have some firms outside the, um, outside the US. Um, uh, we also then looked, as I said, where are the senior people in these firms. We collected all the data on the, the senior investment professionals. Across these uh, 79 firms, there were 767 senior investment professionals. Um, uh, roughly, uh, a little over half have an MBA. 7% um, have, have a law degree. And of those with an MBA, I'm, I'm happy to say that Harvard is well represented. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's about 30, I guess 38, 39 percent of, of the MBA population here. Chicago was second, Stanford, uh, and Wharton, and then Columbia sort of round out, uh, round out the top five. You know, we wanted to know is there some selection bias here relative to the universe? So, as I said, um, the, Har the Harvard MBAs are 38 percent, uh, Chicago 12 percent, Stanford 9, uh, Wharton 7. Um, uh, Pitchbook, which is um, a commercial data vendor uh, in the private equity industry does their own tabulation of, of everybody in the private equity universe. Um, and uh, in, the, in the entire universe, 26% uh, uh, have Harvard MBAs. So, so again, uh, when I go back to my wife, I share these statistics and, and I tell her that I, that I hope I'm having an effect on what the industry does. And, and one would hope that, that uh, by learning what they do, I can actually potentially influence it. But it is a, it is a big fraction. We slightly overweight um, Chicago because Chicago in the entire universe is 6% and it ends up that we have, as I said, 12% in, uh, uh, in the sample. Um, by the way, I should tell you, I, I shouldn't have to tell a, a crowd of Israelis this, but you should feel free to interrupt me. Because uh, uh, again, you know, it's like, I, I've never, I've actually never been in front of this many Israelis and not been like interrupted before, so I'm getting a little nervous that uh, uh, it's okay. So, what? We become quieter with size. <laughs> Are you sure that's true? <laughs> yeah, okay, um, but please, I mean, you should feel very free uh, at any time to, 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 to ask a question. Is there a question over here? You just, you see, my students do this all the time as well. You know, they, they sit there with their hand like this and I call on them and it's like, you know, you just keep the hand down on the desk. Hands on, hands on the desk here. See, and I reserve the right to cold call as well, which is again, a, a long Harvard tradition of, of cold calling people. Um, uh, so, so, so if you don't ask questions, I will make you ask questions. Uh, so please uh, don't, don't, don't hesitate. Oh, you have a question over here. Why do you care whether these people went to school? Why do I care? So, um, so no, 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 no. So, so one of the reasons is did they get an MBA from a top place where, where you would expect them, A, to be relatively talented, relatively smart. B, you would expect that they would have learned, quote, the right thing to do. Um, and and, and does, does it matter? Eventually, one of the things we want to do um, is, is, you know, we're looking at some underlying performance stuff and the like, but we'd like to know whether, you know, we have, Steve and I have this little bet about whether the Chicago MBAs do better than the Harvard MBAs. There's a personal, uh, there's, a, there, 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 there's, a, there's a personal bet on the line about whether or not Steve's students do better than my students. Um, uh, so, so yeah, no, there's, there's, we'd have to control for all the endogeneity and the like, but I'm sure we can do that. Um, but, um, but at the end of the day, you also like to know, um, I do have some other research in, in venture where, where uh, we actually look at the social ties among individuals. And, and we look across a, a bunch of dimensions like schooling, work history, ethnicity, and gender. And, and the, something which is pervading finance now is, is, is this idea of social, connection, so conne social connections mattering for decision making in financial settings. And so we're very interested in this. And this is just all sort of initial preliminary stuff, but, but we hope to be able to build out this relative to, to some other metrics to understand, do, you know, do, do the backgrounds matter in terms of the industries they invest, invest in, who they invest with, their ultimate performance and the like. So um, there's a little bit of bragging rights here. You know, again, uh, I am biased about, about, about HBS. Um, but, but um, at the end of the day, in this iteration, we're not going to do much with, with the, where they went to school. 
Um, we, will do, we will do some things later on with where they worked prior to starting their private equity firm and whether they were investment bankers or whether they were consultants. Does that influence the, the strategy they employ when they, um, when they make investments? So that's, that's, that's good. Keep coming, guys. Keep coming. Um, uh, this is just you know, the size of the companies they invest in. And you'll see, uh, you'll see what we do here. And I'm just going to highlight some of these numbers. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. I know, um, but but we, when we look at these firms, most of the cuts we do in the first part of the paper are to look at large, large firms versus smaller private equity firms. We look at firms that have had historically low rates of return versus firms that have high, had high rates of return. And then we look at those firms which only have offices in the US versus those firms that are global private equity firms. And, and not surprisingly, you, you, know, you do find that, that, uh, that, the, that the, the larger private equity firms generally tend to put more of their portfolio in, in much larger companies that they have uh, they have 28% of their investments in companies that have enterprise values in excess of a billion dollars. Yes, in the back. Do you also survey how many transactions they had same year, or do you break it down to that? Uh, we, did, we, didn't, we didn't break it down to that. We do have some questions. I'm not going to talk about them here. But in the, in the paper, which, uh, which um, I, I provided, and you're happy to, to get, um, um, we, we do some stuff on the selectivity of the deal funnel. Like of all the deals, that we, how many deals they look at. And then of all of those deals, how many do they end up doing? So how many get through each part of the investment funnel and how selective they are based on, on these types of things. So we do do some stuff um, there. But in, in, in the sake of time, uh, uh, we're not going to go over those, 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 those results. Um, great. Um, so the first set of things, and this is, this is the one where, um, where again, I think we as, as finance uh, academics have the most, um, the most strong conviction, I would say, at least the strong conviction in if you go to any induct in inductory, uh, introductory finance text or if you go to any course, what do we teach? We teach discounted cash flow. That's how we should value companies. That's how we should make investment decisions. And so, so that, was, that was a question that, that we sort of asked. And so, um, so this is just the response to the question, how do you evaluate a deal? And as you can sort of see here, um, discounted cash flow in the form of either APV DCF or WAC DCF, uh, you know, Five uh, percent. It's it's just tiny. And in fact, when they rank them, there there there's a huge fraction of firms who never do a discounted cash flow ever. Do a discounted cash flow. They do IRR analysis. They do a multiple of invested capital, or they may do some sort of comparables analysis. And and what's interesting is that this is very different from CFOs. CFO in the Graham and Harvey survey, something like in excess of seventy percent of CFOs do discounted cash flow and calculate cost of capital based on CAPM. And they took this as comfort that, hey, you know, finance is doing well. But I would argue that if you look at the CFO, my, my students who get a two, they become CFOs. My students who get a one, so we can do ones, twos, and threes, not A, Bs, and Cs. My students who get a one become private equity investors. So why is it the case that my smartest students out there aren't doing what I teach them to do, and my sort of mediocre students, oh, yeah? What am I see peer comparison on the list? That would be comparable company EBITDA multiples is what I would think about. Okay. So, so um, this is yeah. So, so you set, so you take a selection of, of comparable companies, you get their their uh, uh, total enterprise value to EBITDA, and you use that to say how much this company is worth. Uh, is that what you would mean by peer comparison? Okay. So they, that that's the third most free, That's the third most common thing that they they actually do. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, my finance colleagues in the room. I mean, I'm depressed. I look at this and I'm really depressed. <laughs> Um, yeah, Yaka. I remember uh, Fisher Black at the seminar at MIT saying that it's very difficult, you know, to, to <laughs> discount once because you do not know the discount, uh, uh, what discount to take. You know, the, the errors could be very large, and uh, <coughs> and it, it goes into the uh, denominator. You know, yeah. you can have. Uh, Huge differences by, sure. by assuming different uh, discount uh, rates. So th 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 absolutely true. But but if you look, I mean, if we look at investment analyst reports from from investment banks, if we look at again the response to the Graham and Harvey survey, people out there use CAPM. People out there do discounted cash flow. 
And uh, so, so these, I, I guess but, my. But you said the Desmalto ones. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Okay, okay. So this is a different theory, which is you know the the smart students understand that cap M's a load of crap, and therefore, uh, then why are they sitting through through first year finance anyway? Um, yeah, to get a yeah. The fund managers by themselves are being valued by IRR. Yeah. By the limited partners. Yeah. So they just fix the way they value the portfolio firms to the way they are being valued by yeah. them. Yeah, we'll, we'll sort of, that, one of the things we'll sort of get there because I'll have some, some of those questions. But it's certainly the case that, that limited partners view private equity as, as an absolute return asset class and that, that they think. Um, they just measure nominal returns. They don't risk adjust those returns. And when private equity firms market themselves, they typically market themselves as an IRR vehicle. They sort of say, we're going to generate between 15 and 18 percent net returns to you. And that's probably part of it. But, but, but you know, again, there's a circular reasoning here. Of course, you know, you're marketing these IRRs and, and, and they're going to sort of uh, make their investment decisions by them. Why not just sort of say, you know, we're, you know, we're a positive alpha business. You know, we're, you know, here's the risk of our underlying portfolio. We're evaluating these firms based on their risk and trying to find uh, investments that, that, that are positive NPV. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I think there's a, there was a, there's a relationship there, but I'm still not convinced why. Uh, why, you know, why that exists in the first place. Um, okay. Um, uh, and this is just, this is just sort of the, the ranking of, of these different things. So we asked not only do you use it ever, and that was sort of did they ever use it, but in, in ranking it in terms of, of, of uh, you know, is it, is it your number one, number two, number three, whatever, and you can sort of see IRR's number one, earnings multiple number two, hurdle rate, so you can sort of see how they uh, how they rank these things, and by far, by far, by far, the predominant way that they look at things, uh, number one by virtually every single fund was IRR. And, and again, I, I, I don't know how many of you took first year finance, and I always, I always like, you know, we, we have these things about the fallacy of using IRR to make investments. And, and uh, you know, again, um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the number one thing that, that virtually every single private equity firm does with their, with their investments. Um, then, then, then we sort of talked, um, uh, talked, we asked them questions about how they calculate their weighted average cost of capital. Um, 27 of them, 27 of our, of our respondents said they never calculate a WAC, ever, zero, ever. Um, and again, that's, that's sort of depressing because we probably spend weeks on the right way to calculate WAC. But uh, I'm thinking we could redeploy this now. We could talk about American football and we'd probably be you know, utility enhancing for everybody. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and, and so, um, so 27, 27 said um, that they explicitly they don't use WAC and 10, 10 uh, um, indicated NA. And so we're assuming those 10 go with that. Uh, so that's half of them. Uh, never calculate a whack. Um, so, what? You, are you getting depressed? You want to finish the PhD now, or just exactly? We'll take up art history. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, no, I, no, no. But now we all feel like parents, right? Our parents. We try to teach our kids, and do our kids ever do what we teach them to do? No, of course not. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Um, and then, then we asked some questions, a number of years of forecast. It's sort of this interesting thing that, um, that, that every, single, every single firm out there does five years of forecast. I don't, five, there's a magic number, five. And five is just that magic number of years that they, uh, that they forecast. One firm says they do seven, one does three, one does four. But um, you know, again, and, and, and here it's actually a little bit, um, Back, back to, 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 to Daniel, Daniel points. This is a driven, I think, a lot by their investment horizon. So we often think of private equity as being long-term investors, but they're not. Private equity firms are short-term, oh, medium-term investors. That, that, that the dominant uh, form of private equity is li these limited partnerships that have, have finite lives. And you certainly see lots of situations in which um, the private equity firm really has to worry about selling companies um, near the end of the life, and so they typically have a roughly five-year uh, investment horizon. So, so that's what goes into their that's what goes into their projections. This this sort of five-year horizon being driven by their holding period of of investments. Um, uh, how do you calculate exit value? Um, 
typically, again, they, they do sort of comparable companies, comparable transactions. Sometimes they do a DCF uh, terminal value growth rate, but, but primarily, again, you know, it's like, how do you get a terminal value? Well, you should do a terminal value based on R and G, right? At least that's what we teach, you know? One plus G over R minus G. Yeah, I know. It, it means nothing to most of you guys, but, but to us finance guys, that's, a, that's the inside joke, right, Yuck? <laughs> it's, uh, you, 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 go, you go to a cocktail party and you say one plus G over R minus G, and immediately the finance people will, will, will sort of gather around. And, uh, uh, but do you have a sense if it's the same in other professions? Like the doctors, do they do what they, or the drivers, do they drive the way they do? <laughs> I, like, these are heuristics that are easier to apply, and once you, you know, that doesn't make a big difference in many cases. But, but, but yeah, okay, I guess that's right. Maybe the difference is small. Maybe the maybe the the, 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 the delta would be small if they did the other things. But if, if it's closer to the truth, you'd think that there might be a competitive advantage, however small, doing it the way we the, 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 doing the way we teach. So 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 can you get on average it right if you do IRRs? Sure. But the question is, could somebody who did thoughtful discounting and, and by the way, these you know, I've done a lot of work on venture, and, and in venture, it's impossible to, 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 to estimate cash flows. Impossible. You know, it's like standing today, what some new cybersecurity software is going to be able to generate after I actually program it and try to sell it to people. You know, your guess is as good as mine. But these businesses here are businesses that are generating positive cash flow. They're, they're companies that have been in existence. So, so it's not the case that you can't estimate the cash flows of these businesses. They, um, they just choose not to, to, to try and estimate cash flows and, 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 and discount rates. Um, is there a difference between Harvard and Chicago students? <laughs> is there a difference between Harvard and Chicago students? Um, uh, not that I found yet, but but anyway, uh, well, certainly in per performance V, <laughs> exactly that. No, I, I uh, um, yeah, it's quite. Um, it's actually it's actually a quite dangerous thing. So I will. Uh, I, if I bore you with stories, by the way, you guys can say get back to the slides. But so I, in my course, um, I, how many people know who, uh, who Apollo is, the, 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 the private equity firm Apollo? At least some of you might. So Apollo is one of the world's largest private equity firms, started by Leon Black. Um, Apollo has a notorious uh, reputation for uh, value extraction. So they exploit contractual weakness in debt contracts a lot. So uh, I wrote a case on Harrah's where they bought you know, the casino chain. And essentially, they, 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 Harrah's had investment grade debt outstanding, investment, investment grade bonds. And they were able to stick $22 billion of debt in front of that investment grade bond. And, and those bonds fell by $3 billion in value in a day because they were able to put this, this debt above it. And I've got, I've, got, um, a, 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 I've got a case on charter communications. I have three cases in which Apollo does this, where Apollo basically exploits contractual weakness and shifts money from somebody else's plate to their plate. So pure value extraction. And um, at the time, I actually had, um, sitting in, in the back row, sort of where, where the gentleman with glasses um, is sitting, I had Leon Black's son, Ben Black. He was sitting in my class, and, and he, he stood up at the end of the third case and said, I can't stand for this anymore. I just can't stand that you're maligning my father. Anyway, it, so this gets dangerous. Um, and so to the extent that I offend you, what's your name? What? Arel? Not you. I was asking him with glasses, I said. You're beautiful, too, but, <laughs> yeah, but the no, no. <laughs> So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's OK. Uh, I'm just trying to keep them awake, Isha. It's like. Uh, you know, after they've eaten and stuff like that, and it's hard to keep them. Know. You never know. By the way, I, for those of you who want stories about Yishai, Yishai and I went to, to, to doctoral. Uh, we did our PhDs together. And I, I've got some stories about, about <laughs> the party animal that he was in, in graduate school. <laughs> uh, the dean of the business school. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's OK. It's, it's OK. Um, Anyway, uh, the compliments we can. Um, this is this is another one of these really really interesting things, which is um, uh, what IRR do they target? So so um, uh, private equity firms um, have this. In, the way that, the way they do their investment decision making is they they project out EBITDA for five years. They usually take some some comparable com company multiple, get an exit value for the enterprise, subtract out the debt, and then calculate their IRR. 
And then they have something that they call a hurdle rate, which is if the, if the, if the prospective IRR is above our hurdle rate, we're going to do the investment. So, so that's, what? So what's the hurdle rate? How do they set it if they don't? Just wait. Know just, th that's, the, uh, yeah, that's good. So, so that's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> um, the first thing we ask, though, is, is what's their hurdle rate? And the me median is 25%. It ends up that in excess of 80% 80, 80 of private equity firms use 25%. It's sort of like that number that was on the third tablet at Sinai. And it was like, all private equity firms shall use 25%. And, and Moshe dropped it on his way down. And so we, you know, and then he picked it up in just 25. So, um, so no, but it's so universal, 25%. And it's interesting, where does 25% come from? Um, again, I, I don't know. There, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of smaller private equity firms that have 30% as their hurdle rate. But by and large, every private equity firm in the world says that they target 25% rates of return gross on their investments. Um, and then the question about like, um, uh, how does the target IRR vary? They say this amorphous firm riskiness. There's no notion of systematic risk, it's just riskiness. So, so a company that is slightly earlier stage or a company that's in distress or something like that, they increase the discount rate. So, so they adjust for systematic, they, they adjust for total risk but not systematic risk. Uh, le they'll adjust for leverage, that's actually a good thing. Okay, maybe I taught them something that you lever something up, it should have a higher, uh, higher expected return. Uh, historical return expectations of the, of the limited partners may play into it uh, a lot. Um, uh, do, uh, do they adjust the cash flows? They do some things with, 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 with GDP and the like, but uh, uh, that's less interesting. Um, uh, yeah, again, you know, our conclusion here is that there's some ad hoc multi-factor model. There's some a view of the world that private equity investors have that they use these heuristics that where they try to adjust that 25% number up or down based on some some sort of uh, sticking a finger in the air about, about what, the, what the risk of the company might, might be. And these, these results are at least a little bit related to some of the stuff from, from Graham and Harvey. Um, uh, again, this, this gets back to, to, to Dan, your question, which is what do, they market to their, what do they market to their LPs? So when I go out and raise money from you, if you're an insurance company or pension fund, you know, it's the case that, that typically they market either net IRRs, uh, they, are, they, mar they market net cash on cash. Um, so by and large, most, most of these benchmarks um, uh, aren't, have nothing to do with alpha. They don't market themselves as we're, we're, we're generating alpha, we're generating positive risk adjusted returns. They generate some, some sort of net number uh, that doesn't really have much of a relationship to, to the underlying risks of the investment. Um, again, what return net of fees do you market to your limited partners? This is sort of... Uh, what, the, what they market, uh, they market, you know, so, so see now the, the hurdle rate before was a gross number. This is, this is a net number. So this is the number they tell their LPs they're going to be able to generate for them in their, uh, in their marketing, uh, marketing material. Um, so again, it's some, it's, you know, somewhat, one would expect it to be somewhat lower than the, than the gross return and, and in general it is. Um, you know, again, I, I think that this relates to sort of what I was speaking about earlier, which is that, that in general, PE firms believe that their limited partners evaluate them like absolute return vehicles, like hedge funds, and therefore they don't, they don't market risk at all. They, they just market these, these gross returns. Um, and and um, anyway, that's... Uh, so anyway, any more questions on investment analysis? Because now we're going to start feeling a little bit better about ourselves. That's the most depressing. See, I've always been told you put the most depressing stuff first, and then you start with the, the stuff that makes you feel a little better. Um, any other questions on, in, on investment? Yeah, back. Can you compare it to newcomers in the field of investments? For instance, all kinds of startups and high links of billionaires that out of nowhere uh, paid by user or by likes or by whatever. Um, because I've seen a lot of, I'm a, I'm a small private equity myself. Uh, Do you use DCF? No. <laughs> Do you have an MBA? No. Okay. So you're forgiven. Okay. <laughs> you're forgiven for that. For that. Uh, so after my talk, are you going to use DCFs? Maybe. <laughs> Can't promise anything. Okay. I, I, as I'm saying, it's because I see a lot when, when transactions now that <clears throat> bidding wars and all yeah. kinds of different things are affected by obscure yeah. information. I, I would, that's the closest thing I can call it. And it's really 
It's a question if you ever look into it and see what it's doing to the market. Yeah, so, so um, I have certainly uh, written papers on, on this general effect and um, um, ha have written, a, I wrote a paper back in sort of the 2000 time frame called Money Chasing Deals. And so it's an interesting, when, when, when there's, a, there's an um, exogenous effect of an increase in the money supply to, to investors mm -hmm. that goes to, to bid up the price of those, those assets. So, so there's certainly a supply and demand effect going on. And in certain sectors now, we certainly see this going on where you've got a lot of rich entrepreneurs, you've got a lot of sort of wealthy people coming in who, um, who are willing to pay up for assets. And this is, true, this is true in the US as well. If you look at the growth equity space, there's a lot of people who've raised a lot of money and they're sort of, they call themselves price insensitive. Um, we could call it dumb money, but they're price insensitive. Uh, so, I'll but take your word for it. anyway, I, we haven't looked at it here, but certainly in other contexts, we've looked at this issue about exogenous, the exogenous effect of, of money flowing into the venture capital private equity space and how it bids up the prices above fundamental values. So, yeah. Is it the case <laughs> that uh, those people use only financial? Uh, data as tools for decision making or they look at the business, you know, and so on and so forth. We, we teach them that only the cash flows and discounts uh, matter. It doesn't really matter whether you are in this business or the other, but people do look at, uh, at other uh, uh, features or, yeah. you know, what business is it? Uh, yeah. And maybe this uh, overcomes, you know, the, the financial... Uh, yeah. No, no, I, there's certainly a lot of that. And, and in the private equity spa space, stability of cash flows is by far the most important thing that they look at because for these firms, most of them are doing leveraged transactions here. And for most of them, the ability to, to, to continue to pay the debt it ends up being an important element. So understanding the business, the sustainability of the cash flows. The, the other thing, um, especially for a certain type of the private equity firm, is their ability to, to, to influence the direction of the company and improve, improve the company's operations. Um, and and, and we'll, you'll see a dichotomy in the data in a little bit in which some of the private equity firms have pure financial engineering sort of strategies and others have more of an operational strategy um, it, it sort of employed. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's sort of interesting to sort of compare the two. And we would hope in the long run, those that focus on, on those other things as well are going to do better. Um, I think it's still an open question. We don't have a long enough time series here to really, really test that. But, but does that softer analysis um, help them? And, I, I, and certainly there are those that focus a lot more on those softer, those softer issues. Uh, you'll see, by the way, that a lot of them change management. They do lots of things in, the, in these companies. There was a question over here. Yeah. <coughs> Not <coughs> so. So you're asking a question which is really, really close to home. So um, in this data, in private equity, it's hard to identify investments with individuals because because in general, there these are larger deals that are worked on by teams. But in the venture, I do have a paper in the vendor uh, in, in the venture capital space where where it's a paper called Gender Effects in Venture Capital, and we have data on every venture investment from 1986 to 2012. It's roughly 40,000 investments, about 15,000 venture capitalists. Only 7% of that 15,000 are women. Um, uh, and, and this paper's actually gotten a, a bunch of press because there are uh, some very major lawsuits in the US going on now about gender discrimination in venture capital. Kleiner Perkins, for example, is being, uh, Ellen Powell is suing uh, Kleiner Perkins, one of the preeminent US venture funds for gender discrimination. And so what's interesting in this paper where we look at the performance of individual investors, the women perform worse than the men, controlling for their demographic characteristics, the characteristics of the company. But we, I wouldn't have written the paper if that was the only thing in the paper. Believe me, I, 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 I've been sensitized. As Elon knows, we've been sensitized to this, right? Uh, 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 Elon Kohlberg is, is a colleague of mine. And, um, so, so, so what we end up looking at is, is what potentiates the underperformance. Is there, or is there something that can alleviate the underperformance? And what we end up finding is that, that women in, in smaller, newer venture funds perform substantially worse than their male colleagues, but, but women in large 
larger, more hierarchical venture funds perform just as well as the men. And then we undertook some interviews and surveys to try and understand why. And, and the result actually ends up being related to, to informal mentoring, that these are small organizations where informal mentoring in general doesn't work well. Because if you're a woman, uh, I had one example of a woman, a woman uh, junior partner who talked about how um, she was the only female in, in the firm, and she talked about how um, she found out, like on a Thursday, that all, the, that all the other investment professionals were going on a ski weekend to New Hampshire, and, and she said, why wasn't I invited? And they said, well, this is just like guys being guys. And, and in small organizations, those kind of things happen, but when you put formal hierarchies in place with mentoring and the like, it actually allevi alleviates the gender gap. And so, so we like to say the women reason underperform in ventures because their male colleagues don't do enough of the formal mentoring that would help them improve. So that was a long way to give you the punchline that's not in this paper but in another paper. <laughs> so, um, so, but, but we're now actually collecting the data on, on um, those 40,000 entrepreneurs. So we're collecting the data on female entrepreneurs of venture-backed uh, startups. And similarly there, the, 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 patterns, the patterns at least of founding companies have some interesting things. We haven't done the performance stuff yet, but, but maybe, maybe Yishai will invite me back in a year or two and I can talk about female entrepreneurs uh, and, and the, the perspective of female entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm, ha I'm happy, to, happy to go on. I'm, I'm the father of three daughters, so I have a, I have a strong... Uh, I have a strong bias. It's been beaten in my head, believe me. My, my wife was the first woman study co studies concentrator at Harvard, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the typical sort of Jewish husband who um, anything, anything my wife says, it's yes. When do you want me to do it? Yes. Uh, and <laughs> I'd love to do that, honey. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, uh, sorry. I can, st I can do stand up for the rest yeah, of the you hour. You're quite okay. good at that. <laughs> uh, no, hopefully, hopefully there's some educational content here too. Hopefully you guys are getting. Um, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm happy to talk broadly about if there are specific questions about other research topics I've done, like the women, uh, women stuff or, or some of the other stuff. I'm happy to sort of dive into that as, as well. But I'm going to continue through this for right now. Um, so then the second set of <clears throat> questions that we asked um, looked at the issue of... Um, capital structure and how do, how do firms set capital structure. And there's a paper that, um, that looks at uh, private equity backed firms after they go public. Uh, it's by Axelson, Jenkinson, uh, uh, Stromberg, and Weisbach. Um, they look at, and, and they basically find that um, the, that uh, firm, uh, private equity backed companies once they go public seem to have a trade off, to trade off the benefits of, of the interest tax shields of debt versus the, the, the cost of financial distress. Um, and and um, that, that's sort of one, that's the first thing we teach. I mean, I would imagine that, that that's the classical thing that everybody teaches. You know, from, how many of you remember from your first year finance course where you get this little curve about sort of firm value and debt, you know, and as debt goes up, the firm value goes up because of the interest tax shields and then it goes down when the risk of financial distress goes up. So the fact that they're thinking about that, at least in the, in, in, in the Axelson et al. paper is good. We'll see whether it holds for our guys. Um, and then this qu the, the question is, um, uh, PE, or PE firms all, also, you know, do they, do they try to time the market? Do they, do, do they believe that markets become irrational and that debt becomes cheap uh, at certain times? And do they try, try to time the, time the, time the debt market? Um, and and, the, and, the, and the, this market timing, uh, debt is cheap, is more controversial among academics. Those of us who are behavioral economists generally tend to think that markets can become uh, dislocated and that, that, and that prices can deviate from fundamental value or to put it another way, debt can be cheap. Uh, there are others in the room who would think that was heresy, but um, anyway, it depends, upon, uh, it depends upon, I guess, your religion. Um, uh, uh, the, and, and so anyway, when the, the Axelson et al. paper, they find no evidence of the trade-off theory, uh, but they do find some evidence that, that firms favor cheap debt. So this is, this is after the firms, after the portfolio companies go public. So what, what do we see? Um, so, so the interesting thing that we sort of see is that there seems to be uh, a lot of evidence that they try to time the market. So they say that they take on as much debt as the market will, will give them. Uh, they, uh, you know, when current interest rates are low, they, they tend to take on a lot more debt. Um, but there's also a little bit of evidence that they maximize the trade-off of, of debt and uh, the, the tax benefits of the debt and the, and the risk of default. 
Uh, and, they, they, and then when they rank the factors, again, the current interest rate environment seems to be the most important, that they tend to, tend to want to take on as much debt as the market will, will give them when, uh, when, in, when interest rates are low. So um, again, so PE firms generally tend to say the trade-off theory and market timing seem to both be a little bit important. Um, uh, and again, um, the way we try to reconcile this with the Axelson paper is perhaps once these companies go public, they're no longer optimizing their capital structure. Um, and then maybe there's some selection in terms of when they go public. Um, interestingly enough, um, if you go to the, the, the Graham and Harvey survey, the number one, the number one factors that, that CFOs talk about when they set uh, debt policy is financial flexibility. That you know, there's this notion that you want to have slack in your, in your sort of capital structure so that if you need to go out and borrow, you have, you have debt capacity available to you. And there was just no evidence in, uh, in, in, in our survey that, that financial flexibility was important. Um, only, six of them men only six of the GPs mentioned at all this idea of setting, uh, setting the capital structure such that the firms had financial flexibility. Um, um, anyway, so again, that, that gives us a little bit of comfort that at least they're thinking about the kinds of things that we're, we're talking about. Well, yeah. No. So, so this is a question about how the investors set debt policy at their portfolio when they invest in a company. So they're choosing the capital structure of, their in, the, of the companies that they invest in. And we ask the question, when you, when you invest in a company, and you take on debt, what... It's natural, because if the fund can borrow freely, then why should you worry about the flexibility of the portfolio? If, 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 uh, if you, you think that the... Financing. You can provide financing. If you I guess that's right. I guess that's right, if you're a source of financing. Um, and that's right, I guess if you think that, if you think the debt is, quote, cheaper than your capital in some, in some non cap -M type sense, then, then, then of course you'd want to take on as much debt as, as possible at that point in time. Yes, but you know, like Johnson, Johnson would be doing this for city. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, but, but again, in the aggregate, at least the CFOs think in, for the whole companies that flexibility matters. But, but yeah. But it doesn't matter just, just not, not yeah. the company at the, the different level. Right, I think that's fair. I think that's absolutely fair. Any other questions? Um, in terms of ownership and incentives, one of the things we see is that certainly most of the, the private equity firms think about setting high incentives for, uh, for, the, the, for the managers of the companies that they invest in. Um, they, on average, they give top management 17% and the CEOs, CEOs own about 8% of, uh, of the companies. And this compares, um, you know, this is, a, this is sort of a, a huge multiple of what you would see in, in comparable public companies, that, that generally the management tends to own substantially more of these, uh, these companies. On average, in, in larger deals, management receives a smaller percent. Um, interestingly enough, in terms of desirable board size, um, boards in general, when private equity firms buy them, tend to become, become substantially smaller. Uh, the desirable board size seems to be sort of five or, uh, five or seven. You know, was, you know, again, not surprisingly, they don't like to pick even numbers. Um, and with a mix of, uh, of insiders and, and outsiders. You can sort of see on average, uh, PE investors take about three board seats uh, of, of, of that five or seven. So again, uh, quite, quite active in the governance of, of, of these companies. Um, by the way, I, <laughs> many of you in the back of the room probably can't read, uh, can't read the, the, the fine print down there, but um, anyway. Um, how often do they actively advise the portfolio companies that you know, uh, you know, 85 or 90 percent of all the private equity firms here say that they become actively involved in terms of providing advice to the company? That's actually not not particularly surprising. Um, you know, do they recruit management? About a third of them uh, recruit uh, new senior management when they invest in the companies. Um, uh, do you recruit after investing? About half of them recruit new new management after investing. Uh, and in total, at some point, uh, roughly 60% of these PE firms recruit new management, new senior management into the companies. Uh, so there's lots of monitoring. So, so when we at, think about this issue of, of governance and engineering, private equity firms, by and large, become very actively involved in, in the governance of, of their companies. Um, swapping out CEOs, I'm going to... Um, 
So again, meaningful management change both pre and post, and it's consistent with the strong monitoring and upgrading of management talent. Um, in terms of value creation, we look a lot at this issue of operational engineering. What do they do with the portfolio companies? Um, um, uh, th this does relate, I guess, a little bit to the deal sourcing. They say about 50% of the deals are sourced uh, um, uh, by, uh, by their own account, uh, roughly uh, a similar number investment banker generated. Um, these are the most important factors. This relates a little bit, Yaakov, to your question about the, um, what do they consider when, when making their investment decisions. So, so you can sort of see that, that you know, they do think about things like business model and competitive position. They think about the management team here, uh, n another significant factor, um, their ability to add value. So, so there are some of these softer things that certainly figure into their decision making as they, as they think about how, uh, how they should be investing. Um, so, so they should be taking more strategy and less finance. Yeah, like, like the job that, uh, I told you last night, 20%. <laughs> Do you want to tell this to everyone? <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to steal your. I don't steal jokes. So. Uh. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, as long as I footnote it, uh, it would be quite, it would be fine. Uh, we are uh, anyway. Um, uh, the key return drivers, and, and this this these, I'm going to go through these quickly because what I want to spend a little bit more time on is is how all of these factors relate to the to the to the type of firms that we have, where we do at the end of the paper some cluster and factor analysis. So. So this just relates to where they think the value is going to come from. And, and as you can sort of see, most of the firms say, think, uh, think that, that growth in the business is where value is going to come from, although at least some believe in, in, in multiple arbitrage, meaning they're going to buy low and, and, and ultimately sell, sell high. Um, these, these are complicated ones. Uh, th this, is, uh, you know, this is who works on the deal in terms of uh, uh, pre-deal and post-deal. You can sort of see the deal team and operating partners are, are, are intimately involved uh, and, and intimately involved after the deal as well. So, so the sort of in terms of operational engineering, the summary of all those things that I went quickly through were that uh, private equity firms do place a meaningful emphasis of resources to try, try, to, try to add values to their portfolio companies both beforehand and afterhand, afterwards, and that the PE firms look to things like sales growth, cost reductions, management changes, um, the ability to exit well, as well as improving the incentives and governance of their firms. Uh, this is just sort of some, some, some stuff on types of exits by and large. They look for strategic exits uh, with their companies, relatively few. Uh, uh, focus on our, our fewer focus on IPOs. Um, this is sort of pretty similar to some stuff that Steve had done with, with Per Stromberg. Um, in terms of the market timing, when do they decide, like, the time to exit? Uh, um, you know, one, have they achieved their plan? But most importantly, uh, there is this market timing aspect to it. So the number two choice in terms of a number two factor that influences it is capital market conditions. So they, ha they believe they have some ability to time markets in terms of when, when exit markets are, uh, are attractive. Um, uh, and you can sort of see some of the others. Um, how are firms organized? This is sort of uh, a li little less uh, interesting uh, decision making, who works on the deals. Um, I want, you know, I want to talk a little bit about concerns in terms of the selection of the data, and then I want to go to, the, to, the, to what I think are some of the most interesting results as we try to sort of group these firms by, by what they actually do. So that, you know, we, you know, you know, we might be concerned that they're, they're, they're biased in terms of what they're actually telling us, and they, they might report overly positive um, uh, sense of what they actually do. And, and again, does this actually influence our results? You know, we think it has minimal effects on, on our results about how they value firms because, you know, the use of, uh, you know, DCF and IRRs probably would weight them to want to say more on, on, on DCF. Uh, in terms of maybe they have some incentive to overstate IRR targets, but, but again, uh, I think that, that they, there may be a countervailing factor with that limited partners could be disappointed if they market their IRRs too high. Um, Unlikely that they're biased on the capital structure answers uh, or, or the other, other issues related to in incentives and boards. Um, so so now, now this relates to, to, the, to the data we collected on the founders of the firm. And so one of the things we're interested in is now we have this interesting data 
on the selection uh, on on the choices that they they make. And so we're really asking the question: Is are there um, types of firms that have spe very specific strategies in private equity? And so we do we do what's called a cluster and a factor analysis. And so essentially, what we do is we include. Um, the answers to these questions and allow the data to tell us whether or not the answers group uh, group with each other. Uh, and we just, you know, we look at things like valuation, capital structure policy, management changes, and the like. And, and this is, ignore the top, it's a table in the paper, but essentially if you, if, you, if you run through the data, what you find is that there's two very distinct clusters of firms that answer questions in, in a very related manner. Cluster two in, in this analysis is essentially Firms that focus on operating improvements and bringing in new management. So there are a set of firms that have this characteristic that, that far more important to them are focusing on operations, focusing on growing the firms, focusing on bringing in new management. And there's a second cluster of firms that we call cluster one, which are firms that, that are more financial engineering firms. They focus on, on, uh, on setting debt policy as much as possible. They, they, they sort of uh, maximize the leverage. There's a whole set of things that relate to this financial engineering. And so, so we, have these two type, we have these two types of firms within the data. And then, um, uh, and then we sort of go through and, 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 and we do some, some factor analysis. But, you know, we then, we then do, this, this, um, uh, th do this where we classify firms based on the background of the founders. And we've, what we find is that 27 firms in, in our sample were founded by, um, uh, by, by investors who had financial backgrounds. So they were in investment banking, they were in commercial banking. 25 were, were um, founded by partners with, with operating backgrounds. And these are primarily people who were either consultants or CEOs of, of prior organizations. Uh, and then nine firms were actually started by, um, by um, uh, private investors who actually, their previous job was being a private equity uh, investor. And so when we look at this, what's interesting is, is perhaps um, not surprisingly, but, but, but these are firms that have you know, dozens of investment professionals that the founders, the founders' practices do seem to influence the firm's strategy. So those firms that were started by financial, uh, financial um, GPs tend to favor financial in, in engineering and they invest with the current management and are much less likely to, to bring in their own management teams into these firms. So focusing on the leverage, focusing on, on capital structure. Those firms with previous private equity ba background are those that are more, more uh, strongly engaged in operational engineering. So, so, so those firms um, are ones that generally tend to uh, work to grow the, grow the sales, tend to recruit more directors, tend to, to recruit more management. And those who are operational G GPs end up being somewhere in between. Um, so one of the things that we'd actually like to, that we're, we're intending to do with this is actually follow these guys going forward and see whether or not those strategies matter for performance in, a, in an ex-ante way. Um, so the first thing I would say in terms of why, I did this, why we did this paper to begin with is, um, in general, the support for what we do as academic finance professionals is somewhat mixed. On the, on the investment side, um, it's pretty poor. But on the capital structure side, there is actually some comfort that they're doing what we, what we say they pe should be doing. Um, again, uh, PE investors generally tend to, to, to focus a lot on management, improving operations as, uh, as well. Um, in terms of governance engineering, we find PE firms generally look to have smaller boards, uh, monitor management tightly, um, look at value creation, operational engineering, and, and certainly the, how these firms are organized tends to relate to, to how the, how the, the firms are, are, are managed. Um, again, our analysis suggests uh, some, some different from uh, firm strategies, both in the cluster and the factor analysis, and the founder characteristics actually matter. So with that, I just want to, I'm happy to open it up to, to questions either on this, uh, anything related to, to venture capital uh, research. Um, I can talk about anything you guys want. Distance running, <laughs> Ironman triathlons, yes? I'm wondering if you had any data that relates to the typical size of uh, the stake of the PE in the portfolio companies and how related to <coughs> namely controlling stake as opposed to minority stake. Yeah, so, so that actually, that bifurcates quite a lot. So there's one cluster that typically owns 80 plus percent, 
And there's another cluster that generally tends to own 30, between 30 and 40 percent. And it generally splits by strategy. So, so those firms that tev ten, tend to do leverage buyouts are in the group that, that end up owning 80 percent, roughly. Um, and then those that, that do more growth equity end up owning minority stakes. And certainly those, those um, have different kinds of governance strategies embedded in them when you're a 30 percent versus an 80 percent owner. Yes, back there. So um, our survey is only from 2011 through 2013. So um, it, all the answers are post-crisis. That's a very interesting question. Certainly, um, certainly there are lots of anecdotal differences in terms of what they did. Although it, it sort of turned, it sort of turned around now. So if you look. Um, one of the things I'm working on, and I've, I've talked to Zvi about this a bit, is, is to look at the debt contracts. So, so um, I don't know, do, pe do, people, do people here know what covenant like debt is? So covenant, so, so when you write a debt contract, um, the, the people who lend you money generally in, introduce covenants. And there was a phenomenon in the 2006-07 time frame in which uh, lenders would give you money with no covenants, zero covenants in, 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 in the loans. And, um, you know, we, over dinner last night, we were having this discussion. It's, it, 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 it's sort of... It's become more legal. It, well, well, there's a difference between what happens here in Israel and what happen, happens in the U.S. So, so in the U.S., the contracts are enforced as they're written. And so if, if, if something isn't prohibited in the contract, you can do it. So I, I wrote these cases for my course about how, and Apollo did this in another investment. So I wrote a case on this company they invested in called Momentive. And in Momentive, they did a buyout of Momentive. Um, and then they were able to do this coercive amend and extend in which, again, they were able to borrow more money and place debt on top of the money that they had raised the first time. When, um, and so, so, so the U.S. being the sort of... Um, you know, the, the way the legal system enforces those contracts is that if you don't prohibit it, you allow them to do it. And so, so, so a lot of the debt which was raised in 2006-07 had no restrictions and allowed the private equity firms to do a lot of bad stuff. It, after, in the crisis, the debt that got raised in the 2009-10 time frame had lots of covenants. But now we're back in a market in which covenant-like debt is, is, is pervasive, where lots of private equity firms can raise debt with, with no controls. Uh, and, and we might think, again, you know, I, again, this is where religion comes into play about whether you're a behavioralist, that you, you believe people are irrational. Because, again, I, I think it's um, to give your money to a company backed by people who are smarter than you, who, like, understand the rules of law better than you, who understand contracts better than you, is a recipe to, to, to sort of lose your lose your shirt. So uh, again, I get back to, by the way, so the answer that Ben, Ben Black, by the way, this is, an, this is an honest answer. Ben Black stood up in class and basically said, you know, my father doesn't take advantage of people, he gives them an education. <laughs> that, though, that's a, that is a direct quote of Ben Black in class, that, that his father gives him an education by, an what? An it's an expensive education, but uh, <laughs> No, it's not at all. Uh, no, no. Um, question? Yeah. Let's see. Is it possible that DCF is mostly used for companies with reasonable ability to predict future cash flow, and other methods are used and they don't know? No. Field development or no. So, so, so um, again, the data, the data here is primarily for, for companies that have stable operations. They're, 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 they're stable oper so this isn't, this, this isn't early stage tech startups. These are either growth equity investments, companies that, that are, that are uh, revenue and cash flow positive and, 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 uh, and, and highly leveraged transactions. So th no, and so what's interesting is, is um, as, part of, as, as part of writing the, the cases for my course, I will often get the investment books that they write. And there's not a single DCF in there. And, and they're, very, they're very good at, at projecting cash flow. And they, do, they don't project cash flows. They, they project EBITDA. Because it, you know, it's like they do revenues, they get down to EBITDA, and then they stop. And then they do some EBITDA, uh, EBITDA multiple at the end. And that's, 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 that's what they do. Uh, yes, over Absolutely. So, so, so one of the interesting things is, is I've told, like, over the three years, 
I've actually migrated the way I teach, especially, so the, the, uh, the course that I teach um, is taught in five modules. The first module is deal sourcing and investment, where we teach all these different deal investment um, techniques. And what I tell my students, so here's what I tell my students. So, so um, I teach 180 students. I would say half of them have worked for either four to six years in private equity or investment banking. And what I tell them is when you leave here, you're never going to do a discounted cash flow. But if you understand the discounted cash flow, and, it, and specifically where risk comes from, you're going to be a better investor. You know, the, I think some of these heuristics that private equity firms, when they do their hurdle rates, lead them down the road of potentially making poorer investments than they, than they might. And so we, we do spend a lot of time on DCF. We spend a lot of time, I've written a bunch of cases in emerging markets where how you think about country risk premia matters, whether it goes into the equity risk premia or whether it's a specific factor or some sovereign risk factor. And, and, and nobody, in, nobody who invests in emerging markets does it analytically the way we do it in, in my class. And I tell them that. I say, if you go and you're investing in Africa, you're not going to do what I'm teaching you right now. But if you understand like, the theory behind it, you're going to be better, you're going to have better heuristics based on what I teach you. And so absolutely. Three years ago, I would have just marched right through and said, do this, do this, do this. And certainly now, uh, now, I'm, uh, now I'm certainly much more um, flexible in terms of, I guess that's the right word, flexible. Um, but absolutely, this has is, this is certainly influenced the way I think about uh, what I teach. Jakob. You, you identify the cluster of uh, uh, those uh, people who focus on improving operations. operations. Yeah. Do you teach how to improve operations Abs at, at, at the uh, HBS? <laughs> Do we? Uh, we hope. Uh, how we hope so. Identify some optimal manager. Yeah. So this is this is what. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Um, so so we hope we hope that they learn this in in, in their entire MBA. Um, but we certainly, you know, one of the things I do in, in, in terms of where I think financial analysis can be important is to, 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 to both prospectively and retrospectively understand where the returns came from and how much of the returns actually came from operating improvements from, um, by, and, 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 and a whole set of things. By the way, there's this other interesting thing which, which private equity fir firms think about value creation of leverage actually by the debt pay down. So, so when, they, when, they, when a private equity firm measures how much value they created with, 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 um, with leverage, they, they just say, we started with this much debt, we ended with this much debt, and the difference between that is the value created by leverage. Uh, and that's, again, another one which is just, uh, you know, how can that be value creation with leverage? Um, it's just the interim cash flow which you use to pay down the debt. Um, but I get my students to understand where leverage can create value. And again, I think by teaching them that, they can be better, they can be better investors if they understand there's a difference between paying down debt and value created by taking on debt. No, but I, I mean, not, not the uh, financial <coughs> academics, yeah. but maybe other <laughs> academics in oh, the school. Yes, for sure. Teach, uh, no, e e Elon is the one who teaches them how to create lots of value. Um, Right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's all in the strategy. Um, so, so we're the number. But, but no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, if we think about the private equity industry today, there is um, somewhat of a convergence. So if we think about private equity firms that, that we identify as financial engineering, they're, they're the names you would recognize. KKR, CAR, I, shouldn't, I probably shouldn't be saying these names, but, but they're names that you might think of as typical firms started by people who were investment bankers. And what they do is they, they, they sort of think about you know, maximizing debt. They think about all the sort of type of things they would do um, uh, uh, on the financial side. But, but all of those firms are now hiring operating partners. They, KKR uh, bought a consulting firm. Why? Because they want to be able to deploy those resources. So I think, you know, back to this issue of, 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 of a lot of money. I mean, there's a ton of money in the private equity industry. And you, I think you realize now that a competitive, um, uh, a competitive necessity is to have the ability to go into these companies and actually improve their performance. So even those firms whose culture it is to be finance focused 
are, are thinking about how do they include this other, this other stuff. But th the problem with that is they generally tend to be second class citizens. So generally the pay difference between an operating partner and, a, and, a, and an investment professional is actually quite large in, in a firm like Blackstone or KKR or Carlyle, whereas in a firm like Bain Capital, so Bain Capital, 70% of Bain Capital investment professionals were consultants. Uh, and they have a very different culture and, 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 and they value the operating group and so the pay difference between investment professionals and operating partners is very small at Bain Capital but very large in these under, other funds. Okay. Uh, yes? A change to VC, you said that yeah. we could ask you. Anything how, you want. How do you see venture capital change and also crowdfunding? Uh, ah, crowdfunding. <laughs> Now, so, so crowdfunding is, is an amazing in, innovation. Um, there's a question, what do I think, what do I think that the aggregate uh, dollar weighted rate of return on crowdsourced deals is going to be? Um, uh, if, if, if I had a way to short those, I would probably short them. Um, no, a lot, of, a, lot of what's, a lot of what gets crowds, crowdfunding generally tends to be not, they're not really uh, operating businesses that you expect to be net present value positive. I mean, I, I look at Kickstarter all the time and I, I get a chuckle about what people are willing to invest in for like a pen or a, or a cup or a, whatever. Uh, what? Yeah, I know. I know. What do you think about What do you mean? Is it going to make money? Yeah, no, but as compared to Kickstarter, because Kickstarter is really Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, Like, what, so, I, I, what do I, would I, would I be putting money to work through it, uh, or no? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's, there are certain class of companies that ra raise money that way, and I think, I think smart entrepreneurs, um, so the people who raise money through these crowdsourcing venues are, are in general those who, who want the control without the strings attached to the money. Um, and I think in general those are, those are entrepreneurs who generally tend to be, um, Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of a nice word for this, uh, but, but um, I, I, I always tell my students, so, so I, I, you know, I, um, I taught entrepreneurial finance for, for about nine years at HBS, uh, have lots of students who've gone on to raise uh, venture capital and done startups, been on the board of a bunch of them, and I tell them, you know, it's like, you know, having smart money matters, having really smart people on your board of directors matters, take their advice. Um, and, and, and I think in general those who seek dumb money get exactly what they sought. Uh, and so, so in general I think there's some selection bias in who, who goes to get funding on those, those platforms. So um, I think it's a great, it's amazing innovation, it's an, a great natural experiment. It's going to like be, be fodder for lots of academic papers. But um, I'm actually keeping my money elsewhere. Uh, fail gracefully. What? Fail gracefully. Yes, fail gracefully. Yeah, uh, oh, okay, I'm back to you, Shai. Yes? How to evaluate how to technological startups when they're on the seed stage? Oh, um, so how, how do I do it or how do venture capitalists do it? Either way. <laughs> so so I, I don't consider myself a, a technology expert, but I try to have contact with people who are. And so, so there are a bunch of people who I can call who I think you know, can give me a read. So when I have students who come with... Uh, With a, with a crazy business plan for some, some new um, uh, security app or, or, or the like. I, 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 you know, I'm not the kind of person who can evaluate it, but I know people who can. So having that network of people. But for like, and that's the same actually for, for most venture capitalists as well, that they typically, um, there are some venture capitalists who themselves are technology experts and can understand it. But, but by and large, the, the great venture capitalists have amazing networks. And it's the networks of former entrepreneurs. So, Um, so one of the things a venture capitalist will, will often do is they'll have a, uh, you know, so they're successful entrepreneurs, they'll, they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, hey Joe, can you look at this for me and tell me what you think of the underlying technology? Can you, you know, is it going to work? You eventually you have to, to put your money in there. Absolutely. You have to know what the price would be. No, that, that well that's a, that's a different question. What the price would be is generally set by, by sort of, okay, you know, was there a similar company that raised money in the last six months? Okay, that raised money at a five million dollar pre? Okay, it's a five million pre. Uh, it's, they're, they're, they're just um, time, they're ju for early stage startups, they're just the time, you know, when, like for example today, you know, when money, uh, when money is, is readily available at the seed stage, you know, valuations go up because somebody just raised money yeah. at, at, a, at a crazy valuation. 
So, so there's more supply. For early stage, there's a lot more of the supply and demand which, which goes into determining is it two, four, or five. Okay. Yeah. In, in Israel, VCs are trending down <coughs> and angels are kind of replacing them. Yeah. Is that universal? Is that it, 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 it certainly is universal. So there, there, there's some amazing angel groups in the U.S. There are also what we call super angels in the US or micro VCs, I don't know what you'll call them, but they're, they're individuals who actually raise money from others. Uh, and they're, they're typically, a typical super angel fund maybe 25 or 30 million dollars. And they, they, make, they make lots of very small bets across lots of, um, across lots of young, uh, young startups. So, so um, there's certainly, um, there certainly a, a, a much broader ecosystem of funding, not just in Israel, in the US, and um, uh, you know, it certainly certainly means that that the VCs, the good VCs, have used this as an opportunity to what they call de-risk the investment, let the early investment be done by angels, and come in at a point in which the technology has been proven, the market's been proven, or something like that. So they at least argue that that it allows them to deploy capital at least after some point of the of the risk return has been uh, realized. So. But, but it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And, and certainly, I have colleagues who are doing some, some interesting research on angel networks. So there, there are a bunch of these angel networks in, in Boston and in Silicon Valley where um, groups, of, groups of former entrepreneurs come together. And, and you know, six people will come and present the, their startup idea. And then they'll, then they'll collectively work. So some of these, like Band of Angels or, or SB Angels, will, will actually um, they come to present to a group of maybe about this size. And anybody who's interested can band together and then, do, and then do collective due diligence and then pool their capital to invest at an early stage in those companies. So there, there are a lot of interesting module, models. And I think the, the angel network has a lot, a lot better characteristics than the crowdsourcing network. And, and I think a lot of the angel stuff is actually quite good for the entrepreneurs. And are the VCs still doing well? So uh, it's really bifurcated. So VCs are now doing much better. So the so um, return. So I, I um, um, you know I can I can sort of tell you that that for 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 you know six or eight years in the 2000s, much like in Israel, venture had a really poor uh, asset class performance. But over the last three to five years, as exit markets have picked up. And, and money is now starting to flow back into venture. It's looking, it's looking more interesting. So, so it's much healthier than it's, than it's been. And, and certainly even in Israel, a lot of what's happening in venture in Israel is not Israeli venture funds, but there's some interesting, U, a lot of US firms are over here. Lightspeed, Bessemer, Battery. Um, they, they, they all have offices here. They're doing investment here. Uh, and, and largely replacing many of the, the Israeli venture funds. So, Isha, you had I, I had a related question. You started, uh, I guess, one of the first slides was about the successful performance of the industry. And mm -hmm. I thought that until recently, the conventional wisdom, when the people used the different data <coughs> for, uh, sources, Yes, but there was a lot of... It was disappointing. So I don't know if things have changed or just the data. So, so, so we can bifurcate this in terms of the PE side and the venture side. So... Um, in aggregate, venture has not been a great asset class. So, so the venture, the early stage uh, investments have not been a great investment um, historically. It's, it's improved a bit over the last several years. Um, and a lot of that is because so much of the, if you do capital weighted returns, so much of the capital was invested in 99, 2000, and 2001. And that, that money was virtually lost. Yeah, exactly. And so on a capital weighted basis, the industry is pretty bad. Um, and it's also the case that in venture, at least, uh, if you take the top 20 firms out, there are roughly 1,000 venture firms, the entire industry's net returns were generated by 20 funds. Um, now, on the P side, it is very different. So I'm talking now growth equity and buyouts. Growth equity and buyouts have actually had positive risk-adjusted returns, and this is pretty, pretty constant. You know, there is a little downturn during, the, during those funds that were deployed in the financial crisis, but by and large, private equities had, had positive risk-adjusted returns, and that's pretty consistent. That's across like half a dozen papers have essentially shown this on both a net and a gross basis. So, this question. Part of the, my first, how do you see VCs in like 10 years? What, what will change? The, the internet and the, the flow of yeah. data, what will it change? So you say crowdsourcing is not going to work, but what will change in, in VC? Because so it's going down, you said. So. No, 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 venture. It's becoming more. It's becoming more concentrated. So, so there, there are firms that are that are that 
at a drop of the hat can raise $2 billion. So, so you have the Excels and you have the Andreessen Horowitzes of the world, you have the Sequoias of the world. Um, and then for others, it's very, very hard. But if you look on average over the last decade, there's been, in the US, and I'm talking about the US data, there's been give or take $25 billion per year raised. And I think that's a healthy number. If you look at the number of startups you can invest in, I think that's a healthy, uh, a healthy amount of capital. Um, but it's being concentrated in fewer, in fewer firms. Um, but, but to your question about crowdsourcing, so, so I've actually done some papers that actually try to identify value-added value -added, um, actions that the venture capitalists actually take. So if I go back to this data that I have on um, every venture investment in the US from 86 to 2012, what we're able to show is that, is that the top quality venture capitalists um, do a tremendous job um, recruiting new board members and, and management from their network. So we know if, if you worked for a Sequoia-backed company in the past, it's more likely that when Sequoia makes a new investment, they're going to bring you in as a senior manager in that. Um, if you're on the board of directors of a Kleiner-backed company, when Kleiner invests in another company, they're very likely to put you on the board. And we're able to show these things and how that actually um, dramatically enhances the performance of those companies, increases the success rates of those companies. So, so you don't get that with crowdsourcing. You don't get the fact that, that Kleiner Perkins has a network of 30 years of successful investing and, and, and thousands, that their network is in the thousands of people that they can bring to bear on these companies. And if you think the most important element of a startup is its human capital, you know, you don't get that with crowdsourcing. You, you do get that with venture. And that's why my advice is always to go, when you go to a top quality venture capitalist, that's what you get. You get their ability, you get the branding, and that branding helps you recruit. And the second thing you get is you get their network and their network of people that helps you recruit new talent into those firms. So I'm a strong believer that, that, that the price you pay, which is, you know, you got to give up a bigger share. The price you pay for the capital ends up being worth it at the end of the day. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm, for the vast majority of technology-related startups, I mean, there's a whole class of firms for which venture is totally inappropriate, absolutely. But I would argue that, that for, for the class of companies which are high potential technology startups, the value of venture more than outweighs the additional capital that you're going to give up to get that venture capital. Time and time again, I believe that. <laughs> we don't, but we do not have a private equity fund. No, but you take students, you create them good networks. Yeah, we create, absolutely. You select them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Yeah, we. I have. We have the data. So I have the data on all the venture capitalists as well. So we collected the data on venture capitalists, and and 27 percent of, of venture capitalists in the U.S. have Harvard MBAs. So, um, so it is a great network. It's a. It's a. And and we we find you know again uh, networks are important. I mean, I get back to this issue: social networks in in finance. It's a huge. There's a huge. The personal connections in finance matter a lot. You know, I'm a people person, and 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 so I believe that that. The ability to identify these connections really do uh, really do influence outcomes. Um, there was a question up up here. Yes. I guess Mohammed uh, has having in venture room where students invest money in the like, course that you take. So um, uh, so we do have we do have um, uh, a, a innovation course and we do allocate some money. Uh, we actually it's interesting. So so we changed the first year curriculum and now every student has to be part of a of a startup. So we, we have a course called Field, which is Field 1, Field 2, and Field 3. Um, in Field 3, they get grouped into uh, teams of students of six. And, they, and for an entire term, they actually have to come up with uh, a, a, a business plan, execute the business plan. We give them some money. But we also then have an innovation lab where students go and, and we have the ability, we have, we have the Rock Center for Entrepreneurship actually has some capital that we're able to allocate to, to student startups. Oh, 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 you mean in public companies or private companies? So, so, um, so that's interesting. Um, so I'm in charge of the second year of the MBA, and we, we actually want to do some of this. But they're, they're, um, this is, again, back to the sort of whole US legal system. Um, the general counsel of Harvard University is very skittish about us giving money to, to students to invest. Um, uh, you know, let's, let's, say, let's say that that student engages in insider trading. Um, where does the liability rest in those kinds of things? How do you police it? And so, so we are in the process, and we actually have, um, 
we haven't done this yet, but we run an investment management uh, course where they do simulated investing, and we actually wanted to give them a pot of money to do actual investing. Um, we haven't been able to get the general counsel of Harvard University to give us the go-ahead to do that yet. We're working, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah. To, to their student scores. No, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think that would be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think that, that I think that's really interesting. I mean, I, I think there's a lot a lot of opportunity for these kinds of experiments to to to, to be done. Uh, I was talking with where's Moshe? There, there, there you are. So Moshe and I are talking about in, in, on a, a related to a paper I'm doing on venture capital about maybe doing an experiment. But I think there's all kinds of interesting stuff like this that that can help us uh, explore sort of you know what the hell's going on uh, here. So take one last question. One of the most uh, <coughs> great pillars in all of all those uh, motivation to to try to found which investment will be good in a few years yeah. is what we call the non-risk uh, interest. <laughs> How do you think that we have almost one uh, decade that we are in a, in a, such a risk that is at, at zero? Mm -hmm. All over the, the, the global. Hmm. Does it make a change in the in the lecture that you can see in the in the future about oh. this? In 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 what in what way? I'm I'm just trying to understand the sort of question, uh, really. The, the the problem is like uh, like this. You mentioned the the, the, the ways that the, the CFO takes the the view. Mm -hmm. You mentioned what your students you would like your students. To all the, all those uh, yeah. all those methods are working with a with a very heavy pillar that is uh, the non risk in, uh, ah. interest. Mm -hmm. We are now already a decade with the interest at zero. Yeah. Should it should it change ah. all our uh, theories in the future? Yeah, yeah. because because it, that, that yeah, I understand. Some... I understand. Yeah, no, no. Certain certainly interest rates being at zero. Um, enable a lot of things to be purchased. Uh, it's easy to borrow. Uh, it's easy to borrow. So, so certainly, um, if you believe that you can borrow at the current at, at these current rates, that and those current rates are going to last. Yeah, you, you know, this goes back to, to to you know you borrow as much as you can because you know it's because free money. Losing, when the interest for a long time yeah. is a, is a, is a portfolio, so you are losing the, 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 the mirror yeah. of, of what you are, you are doing in your investment. Yep. This relates a little bit to the to the question on how debt mar why why debt markets become crazy. So there's this chase for yield. So when interest rates are zero, everybody tries to find an, an extra percentage point. And why do people invest in high yield corporate bonds? Because you get this yield. And and when 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 real interest rates are at zero for so long, people are willing to chase yield to the point where I think they make irrational decisions relative to the agreements they sign or relative to the agreements they accept. The middle of the non Abs interest. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. So so people do crazy things when interest rates are at zero. So my question is, how will you ch change your your materials in the future? Oh. At that point? Uh, might, 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 it be, it, might it be to change a few of the of the, the, the methods? To, to, to check of the investment. So there's one sure thing about an academic, which is an academic will tell you what they should have done five years after it happened. So I, if you bring me back in five years, I'll tell you what I should have said today about that. We financial, financial economists are great at saying what's happened over the last five years. I am so bad at telling you what's going to happen over the next five years. Because if I could, would I be an academic? No, I'd be like... I'd be some rich billionaire standing out there, so that's why I'm an academic. But no, I think that's right. I think, I think there are a lot of interesting practical questions when we're in an environment where real interest rates are at zero. And I think there's all kinds of changes for both these types of investors as well as institutions have to deal with in an, in an interest rate environment like we have today. And it's, it, it is. It, it really causes perverse behavior. So anyway, I want to I just thank, um, I want to thank, I mean, I want to thank you, Shai. I want you to say that you're going back to America soon, so they have to stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Yishai, where's the lampshade? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yishai. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.